All right, we're back for part four of our discussion on the modern ban list. Reasons why the card were banned and should the card be potentially come off the ban list. Uh, reference our first three videos for letters A through the beginning of S. If you want to check those out before you continue this video. That's it. Let's get into card number one, Sensei's Divining Top. Now this is a card banned in pretty much every format but vintage. Not because of power level, but because of time constraints. So this card is, one, look at the top three cards of your library, put them back in any order, tap, draw a card, then puts Divine, Sensei's Divining Top on its owner's library. So, turns kind of went like this. Draw your card for the turn, or, you know, draw a card, okay, go through your turn, pass with a mana or two open, go to your opponent's turn. During your opponent's turn, they say they cast something important, you pay one, look at the top three cards of your library, tap Sensei's Divining Top, draw the card that you got off the top of your library, counter your opponent's spell, go to your next turn, recast Sensei's Divining Top, pay one, look at the top three, pass to your opponent's turn. Your opponent does something on their turn, you pay one to do it again, then Look at the top three cards. Okay, they do their thing. Go to their end step. You pay one. Look at the top three cards again. Rearrange it to the card you want to draw next turn, etc. When you combine this with cards like fetch lands, some turns could take three, four, five minutes just to go through the motions without anything actually substantial happening other than constantly rearranging the top cards of your library. Now, the main card this enabled was the Miracles deck. Uh, sometimes it would see play in some combo decks, but this card was really banned for time efficiency purposes, the same reason why it was eventually banned in Legacy. For that reason alone, very similar to cards like Crackline Ironworks and Second Sunrise, it's not necessarily too powerful, but it's just obnoxious in terms of tournament flow and should probably remain banned. Simeon Spirit Guide, if you want to reference some of my explanations for cards like Chrome Mox or Rite of Flame in previous videos, Pretty much this is fast mana that has very few restrictions, enables decks to combo a little bit faster, whether it be, you know, going a turn one right of, or turn one Desperate Ritual on the Blood Moon, or turn two Violent Outburst. This card's just fast mana, it's generally not good for the format, and most decks that utilize this tend to be things that are doing very busted things. This was part of the cards that were banned in decks that could kill on turn one, decks like Neoform, Combo, etc. And it just needs to not be part of the format. Skull Clamp. Skull Clamp is a unique card that was banned just because it has the ability to do inherently very broken things. Uh, most of the th broken things in Magic do one of two things. They're either mana, fast mana, or absurd amounts of card draw for low mana. Um, cards like Necropotence that have been banned throughout man's history. Skull Clamp kind of falls into the latter category. Now this is a, a one mana equipment that for gives a target creature plus one minus one. Whenever equipped creature dies, draw two cards. So the way this card would be abused is play a one mana creature, say like a Memnite, play Skull Clamp on turn one, okay. Turn two, equip the Memnite, your Memnite d immediately dies, you draw two cards. Okay, so you happen to draw another 1 mana 1-1 one, one, or 0 mana 1-1, one, one, equip it again, draw two more cards. Uh, this would get out of hand very, very quickly and just would allow your opponent to draw an absurd amount of cards. Hence why it was banned, especially in decks, say a deck like Elves, which have a bunch of X1s running around. This card just needs to stay banned because of the absurd combo ability and the fact that it is very difficult to come back from all those cards being drawn. Splinter Twin, one of the more contentious cards on the modern ban list. Splinter Twin kind of falls in the same camp as uh, Birthing Pod. It's a card that was banned in a, form, in a format where modern was largely different. Number one, you didn't have as many instant speed answers to things. Number two, um, the format was just in need of a shakeup at that point in time. So Wizards decided to ban Splinter Twin right around the same time as Birthing Pod. Uh, this is a card that pairs with Pestermite or uh, Deceiver Exarch. Uh, you can tap it to make a copy of that creature, um, and then 
it comes in or it untaps the original creature, allows you to tap it again. You make infinite copies that kill your opponent. Now you could do this on your, your opponent's end step and then on top with all these creatures, or you could just do it during your turn main phase one and then kill them during your combat step. It's put a tremendous amount of pressure to have certain cases of interaction. At that point in time, things like Fatal Push did not exist. So your only forms of interaction were cards like Bolt and uh, Path to Exile. Nowadays, you have things like Solitude, Unholy Heat, Lightning Bolt, Fatal Push with a Revolt, etc. Um, this card could conceivably unban, but if you're going to unban cards like Preordain that they just recently did, or something like Ponder, this card might be a little bit dangerous to allow out there just to get there to be this readily available blue-red combo deck. But still a card a lot of people would like to see unbanned, especially when they're allowing other powerful four-man cards like Omnath and the One Ring to run around the format. Uh, you could hardly argue that this card needs banned on a power level, but from a gameplay standpoint is the main reason it remains on the ban list. But it is probably the one, one of three or four cards that could easily come off the ban list and still be reasonable for the format. Summer Bloom. Now, this was a part of the original Amulet Titan decks. This deck, what this would allow you to do is go turn one, Amulet, turn two, Bounce Land, on top with the Amulet trigger, cast Summer Bloom. You could then play three additional land drops that turn. And if you happen to have, say, that said Bounce Land, you get to cast a Primeval Titan on turn two with an Amulet in play. Uh, hasty. Smack your opponent for 12 on turn 2, difficult to recover from. Alternatively, you could also ca cast the card uh, Hive Mind, which is a 6 mana blue enchantment that allow you, whenever you play a spell, your opponent gets a copy of the spell. Okay, that doesn't sound terrible, except for when you consider the, the packs that these decks would play. The Summoner's Pack, the uh, Black Pack that I can't remember the name of, or Pact of Negation. You'd give your opponent a copy of a spell they couldn't uh, pay the upkeep for, and then they just die during the upkeep of their turn. Um, both of these were enabled on turn two because of Summer Bloom in a deck that's already capable of turn two, turn three kills on its own now. This card doesn't need to come back into the format for that reason. Tybalt's Trickery. Now, Tybalt's Trickery was printed as a way to give Red a counterspell. That on its own would have been okay. But the opponent should, or wizards should have added the text, opponent's spell, and this card would probably remain a part of the format and just, you know, do whatever. But instead, they chose to have it give it target spell, and that's controller mills three cards, then exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile a non-land card with a different name than that spell. They may cast that card without paying its mana cost, then put those cards on the exile on the bottom of the library in any random order. So what this would allow the, the player to do is to play cards like Violent Outburst, Shardless Asian, or Throws of Chaos, Cascade Spells. Um, as long as there was no card in the deck costing less than Tybalt's, or less than, you know, Tybalt's Trickery was the only one you could Cascade into. You could Cascade, counter your Cascade Spell, and then flip into something random in your deck. Usually the deck would be set up to where you're cascading into an Emrakul, or you're casting an Emrakul the Aeon's Torn, or you're casting an Omniscience, or you're casting Ulamog the Infinite, um, or the Ceaseless Hunger. So frequently, especially when Simeon Spirit Guide was still unbanned, which it was with this card, you could go turn to Violent Outburst, uh, Tybalt's Trickery into an Emrakul the Aeon's Torn on turn two. And that's just not healthy for the format. Um, it is a very volatile deck, so it wasn't always the most consistent, but still very powerful thing that probably should not exist in the modern format. Next card up is Treasure Cruise. Now, very similar to the discussion I had about Dig Through Time, Delve spells that are very cheap and have powerful effects, somewhat dangerous in formats that have fetch lands. Now, cards like Murktide and Tassiger and Gurmag Angler, they're creatures that can be killed, but they still, they're still they still powerful for being able to play a 2-mana 8-8, or a 1-mana 4-5, or a 1-mana 5-5. Treasure Cruise allows you to effectively have Ancestral Recall on your deck if you're playing Fetchlands and such. Uh, this card was seen play in everything from 
prowess shells to burn to all these very lean efficient decks that would just empty their hand you know put a bunch of cards in the graveyard treasure cruise draw a bunch more cards it just was not a healthy play pattern for the format it made cards like thought seize obsolete and it really just came down to how quickly can i fill my graveyard how quickly can i unload the cards in my hand and it just is absurdly powerful if you need a current anecdote for it if you look at the mo the pioneer format which keep in mind fetch lands are not legal in that format with the exception of fable passage and things like terramorphic expanse uh, treasure cruise is one of the few reasons that a deck like arclight phoenix remains competitive in that format even as its payoffs are very very bad uh, treasure cruise just allows you to refill and do absurd things when you have a bunch of cheap cantrips and just is a card that should not exist in the modern format for that reason, as long as fetch lands are legal. All right, next up, Tree of Tales. We want to take a look at some of our other videos I've kind of discussed at length about these artifact lands. Basically, there is a risk inherent with them when you're playing them with things like Disciple of the Vault, uh, Arcbound Ravager, Cranial Plating, all the affinity cards. Um, do I think they're too powerful in the format? No. Is it probably safe to unleash them as a set upon the format? Maybe, maybe not with Mox Double being banned, but basically if you're going to ban one of the, the five, all five should remain banned, but they are cards you could potentially bring back into the format. Umazama's Jite. Now this is a powerful one, two mana equipment that much like Batter Skull or, um, what is the other one I can't think of? Basically, it's another powerful equipment that can get fetched up by Stoneforge Mystic. In part, it was banned because of Stoneforge plus Jace the Mind Sculptor and Standard and the power that those uh, Stoneblade decks would have. The format has probably gotten to the point where a card like Umazama Jite, much like Punishing Fire, could be unbanned just on a power level standpoint. But the problem is, is it really inhibits creature-based decks. And creature-based decks already have enough problems with the pitch elementals and unholy heat, and bolt, fatal push, etc. I mean, the format has even gotten to the point where one of the former premier removal spells in the, the format, Path to Exile, barely sees play anymore. So adding yet another option to hold down creature decks just doesn't seem like the correct thing to be doing in the format right now. So could it be unbanned from a power level standpoint? Absolutely. Should it be from a gameplay standpoint with the way the format currently stands? No. Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Now, if you want to go back and look at our video about Oko, very similar concepts exist here. This is a card that is supposed to be the sister card of Croxa. Now, Croxa, whenever it comes in the battlefield, forces your opponent to discard a card, or they lose through life. Kind of a powerful effect, but still rather well balanced. Uro, on the other hand, comes in, they draw a card, and then they can put a land from their hand on the battlefield, and they gain three life. This largely invalidates most forms of aggressive decks in the format and makes the Omnath piles being able to grind through almost anything that isn't able to go over the top of it, like Creativity or Trog. Uh, this card was banned in conjunction with Mystic Sanctuary because of its ability to, number one, repetitive gameplay, Number two, invalidating a good portion of the format. Could this card conceivably unba be ba unbanned in today's format? If the One Ring did not exist, this is a card that could come back into the format and further strengthen the four color Omnath piles. Now, is that necessarily healthy for the format? Probably not, as it would invalidate certain decks like Boros Burn, um, a deck that's already kind of barely hanging on on a power level of the format, even if it is good in certain metas. Uh, for that reason, I think Uro should probably be remain banned, but if it were between this and Oko, I think Uro would be the safer card to unban. Vault of Whispers, see a few entries back about Tree of Tales or other videos like Ancient Den. Basically, Artifact Land, either all five remain banned or it's, you feel it's safe to unban all five. Either which way, bit of a risky proposition, not necessarily worth the payoff, especially when there have been suitable replacements printed for it since. 
And the final card on the modern ban list, Yorion Sky Nomad. Now, from a power level, this is very similar to Luris. It doesn't take much to add this to your deck. Uh, the reason it was banned was not necessarily from a power level standpoint, but more from the similar reasons why they've banned cards like Crackland Ironworks, Sensei's Divining Top, gameplay mechanics. Wizards feels that it's difficult to shuffle an 80 card deck um, and time constraints, basically. Now, is that the best reason to ban a card? Probably not. But it did knock down Four Color Omnath, which was one of the better decks in the format at the time, down a peg. And if you pair this now with the One Ring existing in the format and being able to reset that at almost no cost, I don't think it's worth bringing Urion back into the format. That said, on a power level, it's probably fine for the format, but gameplay mechanics and all that, it's probably okay for it to stay banned, especially as long as Luris is remaining banned as well. And that is the 40 plus cards on the modern ban list. I think I, a few videos I've quoted it as 45. I think my number was a little bit off. It's probably around 47, 48, because I've had to extend the last two videos as a result of there being more cards. But I digress. That is the modern ban list. Uh, if you like this kind of modern content, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Hope to see you for our next video.